Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. What is the secret to cultivating inspiration and attraction in your relationship? And if you're single, how do you find people to date who will truly inspire you to be more of who you are, more conscious, more connected? To that end, I want today's episode to inspire you. We're going to talk about a path to connecting with the parts of yourself that are truly your core gifts and how to bring those into your relationship, into your dating life if you're single, and how to connect your authenticity to the spark of passion. Today's guest is Ken Page, renowned psychotherapist, Psychology Today blogger, and author of the book, Deeper Dating, How to Drop the Games of Seduction and Discover the Power of Intimacy. Ken's book is one of the few books that I've read for the podcast that left me feeling truly moved both by the hope that it instilled in me for single people looking for a new way to connect with others, as well as through giving me a completely new way to frame the dance of attraction within a relationship. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you, too, with the thoughts, awarenesses, and inspirations that come out of this conversation. Ken has generously offered a free signed copy of his book, Deeper Dating, to a lucky listener, all you have to do to qualify is to download the show guide at neilsatin.com slash dating or text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Ken Page, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for joining us on Relationship Alive. Neil, thanks for inviting me. That was a wonderful introduction and I really appreciate it. You are most welcome. And uh, I'm so excited to have you here. As you heard me mention, we've we've talked a little bit about the the journey into finding a conscious growth oriented partnership, but there's not a ton of material out there about how to do it. And your book, Deeper Dating, is pretty much cover to cover a how to manual for mm-hmm. people who are who are out there and, and wondering how am I going to do this. So I'm wondering if we can just start at the very beginning. And maybe you could talk for a moment about the concept of your core gifts and and how your gift theory can lead someone on a very different journey to finding partnership than how someone might typically go about finding a partner. Wonderful. That sounds great. That sounds great. Uh, do you know, I think what what is important about this concept is that it teaches that the very places we feel are the things we'll uh, make love hardest to find, push love away, scare people off, not be attractive, those parts of our personalities, the parts we think we need to suppress or or hide are actually again and again the places that are the powerhouse of our ability to love. Very surprising. And, you know, common culture teaches us all of these tricks and all of these skills for kind of um, airbrushing our presentation of self and acting more confident and playing hard to get and uh, all those kind of all those things that are about uh, making yourself more attractive. And I think in that very approach of having to make yourself more attractive, you are screwed from the start. Uh, because making yourself more attractive means putting a freeze lock on your authenticity and your spontaneity. And that just never ends up working. And it feeds in the most intense subterranean ways all of our insecurities. So that was kind of the story of my life growing up. And uh, I, I think, uh, Neil, I would like to just say something about my experience because this gift theory came so much out of my experience. Please. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, growing up as a gay kid, um, born in the mid 50s, two parents who were, are amazing, amazing people, also Holocaust survivors. So, so they kind of learned you have to be tough. Uh, to survive. And the world around me, there was just no place for a me, <laughs> particularly mm. in this Long Island world that I grew up in. And uh, what I learned to do 
was to hate the parts of myself where my greatest sensitivities were. Now, secretly inside, I never stopped loving those parts of me. But it was dual. It was ambivalent. I hated those parts of me, too, because I found them to be weak and mortifyingly mortifyingly sensitive to the world. So I grew up, and I had to kind of be like everybody else in all of these major ways. I feel like if I went to like a high school where there were, uh, you know, for creatives, maybe it would have been different, but I I didn't. And uh, so the very parts of me that were always aching to be liberated were the parts that I was the most ashamed of. And then kind of coming up in the gay world, you know, where masculinity is so prized and toughness is prized and and the dating world where a kind of thickness of skin is so prized um i was just an abject failure uh i did not do well i would say that like uh for a really long time like over a decade my longest relationship was six weeks and then uh, i went into therapy and i hit a one-year mark Uh, which was amazing for me, (laughs) but not good enough. Um, But, but I, I guess that what I would say is that, that I was pitted against myself because those qualities, which the whole world was telling me I had to really tone down or suppress in order to be attractive were me. So how was I going to do that? I was just locked. I was frozen and unhappy in so many ways. And then entering into therapy and beginning my journey, I began to discover that those qualities that I had abandoned, that I had orphaned, were in fact the most beautiful parts of me. And then this is what happened. And it was almost like it would happen, one thing would happen and then the other would happen. And here's what it was. The degree to which I would embrace the qualities I had previously suppressed my power and my sensitivity. Those would be like the two key ones Mm. to the degree that I embrace those to that degree. I started becoming romantically attracted to people who cherish those qualities because I was attracted to the bad boy. That was like what I was attracted to. And it was because it was, it was um, because I had, I had abandoned, I had orphaned, the honoring of my own sensitivity. So I looked for people who just were numb to that kind of sensitivity. They didn't carry that exhausting burden of sensitivity. And I thought they were it. They were what I should be and never would be. Hence, my search for love was a failure for decades. But as I began to treasure those parts of myself and get behind them and love them, I started dating people who were kinder and who were more available. And that journey continued to grow and grow and grow until I found my partner. And we're just about, after seven years, on the, uh, we're just about to get married. Um, so it's a very exciting period, and he is a good, good soul. Just the kind of guy I would have fled quickly in <laughs> all of those years ago. Um, so what I found is that, and I found this at the same time I was learning it myself, I found it with my clients, the parts of themselves that they felt the most embarrassed about or the most awkward around were their holy places, were their amazing places, were their places where I kind of loved them the most or liked them the most. And I began to realize that our deepest insecurities are the markers of our greatest gifts. And those are the gifts that are going to lead us to the real love that we're looking for. I'm, I'm struck in this moment by thinking about how this is different than the oversimplification of saying like, well, you know, I've been attracted to people who are bad for me. So now I'm just going to like go after people who are good for me because we're not talking about people who are good for you. We're talking about people who, I mean, they are good for you, but not on that superficial level. It's more like this level of being around them allows you to be fully you. Yes. And inspires you to be more fully you. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. This might be a good moment for you to talk briefly about your, um, lovely uh 
contrast between the an attraction of deprivation versus an attraction of inspiration and how that comes into play. Absolutely. I'd love to talk about that. You know, um, one thing that most of us have learned and many of us have learned the hard way is that you can't force your attractions just because someone is good for you. Like you're saying, you can't that that you can't make yourself to be sexually attracted to someone because they're good for you. And I just know so many people who have tried to do that and it ultimately backfires. So we can't force our attractions, but we can educate them. And there's tons of research to back that up. Um, and here's the greatest way I know to educate our attractions. And that is to, first of all, know the difference between two very different kind of circuitries of attraction. So, okay, so most of us know what it feels like to be insane for someone who can't really commit to us or just crazy for someone who treats us well and then ignores us um, or treats us badly. These are what I call attractions of deprivation. And they're powerful, powerful circuitries of attraction. And we all have them, or almost all of us have them, where you just get really attracted to someone who's almost available, who almost treats you well, who you feel like you could get if you just did it right. Like you almost could get them, but then that goes on forever and forever and forever. And those are hot. Those attractions are very hot and very exciting, um, but they scratch an itch. They don't feed a real need. And there's another kind of attraction, which I call an attraction of inspiration, that every one of us and every one of you who is looking for a relationship, I just so deeply encourage you to consider what are your attractions of deprivation? What are the types that have broken your heart or hurt you or not been available again and again, but who you're attracted to in profound ways? And don't assume you're just going to stop being attracted to these people. You won't. But recognize those attractions versus an attraction of inspiration. And here's what an attraction of inspiration is. It's a different thing. It's when you meet someone and you're not only physically attracted to them because you have a right to be physically attracted to your partner, but you're not only physically attracted, you're kind of emotionally and spiritually attracted by the way that they treat you, by a quality of consistency integrity and availability and by the way they are in the world and when you find someone like that attraction is going to build in a different way it's not just going to be that fiery fiery intense thing where you're going up and down and up and down it's more like being fed from the inside and feeling something grow richer and more wonderful and more celebratory and more real as time goes on and that's happiness and that's where we want to look for love but nobody teaches us this we're just taught you go for the hottest person you could find who likes you back and who doesn't have major red flags and then you <laughs> pursue that right and that's just, that's not what works. Yeah, I was thinking earlier about how, um, you know, you mentioned the way that we're taught to find someone by basically feeding whatever it is that makes you attractive to them and how in, in at least superficially, that can be um, feeding the things that are actually unhealthy about a way of connecting with a person, like whether it's feeding their insecurity or their their dependence on you or, or something like that. Um, and I think I've heard yes. of approaches that both for men and for women that involve this of kind of like playing a game until you hook the person. And um, And then I was thinking, well, you know, but if you went up to one of the people who is using that approach and said, well, no, you just want to like tap into your your core gifts and and be be vulnerable and be be who you are authentically, they're going to put that in the frame of this like old dating world. Like what? So I'm going to go to a bar and like wear my heart on my sleeve. Like, right. And and so they'd be missing almost this quality of discernment that it seems like 
it seems like that's what you're getting at is that it's not just like the ability to embrace your who you are, but it's also like finding the people who amplify who you are and and really working on that capacity to discern who's on that wavelength with you and and who isn't. Exactly, exactly. Yes, that's 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 really true, you know, and um that discernment is the way that you can be vulnerable, kind, generous in this crazy dating world and actually be more protected than you were if you were just kind of um following those kind of games. And and I'll share a story with you about that. Please. Um yeah, someone that I'm that uh, I'm working with was uh dating and uh was attracted to someone. He really liked her, she really liked him. Uh but her behaviors were erratic and they weren't ultimately inspirational they were not ultimately inspirational even though all this other good stuff was there and because he had learned this lesson when the relationship ended he was stunned to find out that he was really fine because he was going to end it anyway because he what was most important to him and, and this is an amazing thing was that he had been real the whole way through and because he had been real and vulnerable the whole way through and not ashamed of that he could not be hurt by the end of that relationship in the same way. And that's an amazing, amazing thing is that when we learn to honor our sensitivity, we become, we gain a kind of quality of dignity and we are less hurt by rejection. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing because our ultimate commitment is to find someone who loves us for who we are. And so when we find someone who doesn't love us for who we are, it's okay because they're not the right one for us. So it's a funny thing, but the more we back and support our sensitivity, the stronger we become in the world. It's a kind of strange thing. And, you know, Neil, I'm sure that you uh, see that so much in your coaching work in relationships with people that when they make room for their vulnerability – and enter into a relationship and ask for what they need and honor their needs, they, they're they just stronger somehow and more resilient. Yeah, I think what, um, what comes up for me and what I notice in my work is that when people are operating from the more like, how do I play this game? How do I figure out if this person likes me? All of that stuff then um, then they're operating from this place that's very fear-based. Yeah, and if yeah. it gets them into relationship, then they'll experience the exhilaration of that. Um, but then should the relationship end, since the relationship had this um, foundation, it's, I hesitate to call it a foundation, yeah, but yeah, this um, yeah. core of fear, then, then the end, that rupture of attachment, ends up just sending the person right back to that place of fear, which isn't to say that um, that there's no pain involved in ending a good relationship too, or ending a bad relationship, but there can be tons of pain there. Um, but what you're saying makes a ton of sense to me in that you're not operating from that place of fear. You're operating from a place of where your true strengths lie. So if you're, if you're constantly giving attention to that and, and honoring it, then yeah, you can play when you're out on a date and feel like you're totally in your strength that entire time, even as one part of you is wrestling with, uh, well, does this person like me or don't they? Yes. Because you're operating from that place of who you authentically are, it gives you so much more freedom to actually explore that question and be in your curiosity. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. There's so many pieces of what you said are so, so... Um it makes so much sense. I'm curious if we could go back um, to, because I, I, I don't want to be too vague about this question of your core gifts and who you are th authentically are. And because the way that you describe it in Deeper Dating was very different than what I thought you were going to say about how to know how, like, what are mm -hmm. the, what mm -hmm. are the hallmarks of knowing that you're, you're tapping into your core gifts? So could you describe a little bit of how, what are, you, what are you even talking about? And how does someone recognize the quality of touching upon their, the, the zone of, I forget exactly what you call it. I know you, you mentioned the a few different, zone. Yeah. the gift zone, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, that's. I would love to talk about that, but I just want to. You raise such a good point around attractions of deprivation, so I want to use one last point as a segue into into uh, the core gifts. Absolutely. And that is this. This is for everyone who is looking for a relationship or single or in a relationship that they're wondering about. Here's what it is. If you can make a decision, and it's not a little thing, but if you can make a decision that from now on you are only going to pursue and cultivate your attractions of inspiration and that you're not going to waste your time on attractions of deprivation – your dating life will change in profound ways and you will narrow your field but you'll deepen your field and it's an amazing thing how that works that that the degree to which you honor your core gifts which we'll be talking about in a minute and only look for people who kind of treasure what they see when you're really you you, you kind of like a kind of magic happens that I have never been. I, I can't understand it except, you know, in kind of very wide theological ways. But something happens. You start meeting different people and your search for love really changes this because there's a magic that happens when you do that. And the key to that is in knowing what I call your core gifts. And those are the places that are the most you. You know, sometimes I describe them like shards of God inside us. Um, The parts of us where we feel really deeply, so deeply that sometimes we don't even know what to do with it. So... Let's see, to describe your core gifts and, and, and to help listeners, every single listener or close to it, be able to leave this podcast with a sense of what some of your own core gifts might be. Uh, here's what I'll say. What I'll say is that your core gifts are the places where life touches you the most deeply. So think about that for a moment. Think, of, think about the places where you have felt... Um, That your intensity and passion maybe was very, very powerful for certain things. Your desire for love, your desire for truth, your creative self. Like where is it that your passion has felt like it runs really deep in your being? That's a place of your core gifts. And where has your sensitivity run really deep? Where people have said to you, you're too sensitive. Or you've wondered if you're too sensitive. Those are places where your awareness, your antenna are exquisitely sensitive and pick up things that other people's don't. And the more you embrace those parts of yourself, your passions and your vulnerabilities and get behind them, the more realized as you you'll be and the more beautiful and attractive and uh kind of manifested you'll be and that's different than just trying to act attractive um so there are two key questions that you can ask and here's an exercise that i just want to offer up to everyone who's listening you try this exercise for just two days and watch what happens and the exercise is this you get a journal and over two day period you just make little notes to yourself answering two specific questions What kind of interactions fill my heart? And what kind of interactions hurt my heart in the world? If you go around with your journal, and every time you notice something hurting your heart in your interaction with yourself and the world, you just note what it is. And every time you have that wonderful experience of feeling your heart filled or quickened or moved or deepened, you note that. You note those moments and kind of honor each one of them. After two days, if you look at all of those points, it's like a connect the dots puzzle where you connect the dots and a picture emerges. You will see the themes of what touch your heart and fill your heart the most in your life and the things that hurt you the most. And those are your core gifts, the places where you could be most hurt, and most inspired. They are your places of deepest humanity. And I promise you, those are the places where your magic lies. So talk for a moment about the 
because it makes total sense to me and probably everyone listening that the th- that if I notice the things that inspire me or that fill my heart as I'm going throughout a day, like that makes sense on some level that that would point to the quality of experiences that that I want more of because right. my heart's going to be more full. But what about those hurting my heart ones? Like, how does that? point to my core gifts oh i'm so that was i'm so glad you asked that question because that is so important and and you're right that's kind of the uh the counterintuitive part of this but the part that's so precious and it's why all of this fix yourself to find love stuff just doesn't work so you go through your day and you notice the things that hurt you the things that hurt you are the places where you are the most tender And the places where you are the most tender are the places where your love springs from. Your tender places are where you love from. And the things that hurt you, you will find will be about a break in the connection and a break in the love. In those exact places where love and connection matter most to you. So you might find that if someone is... um, insensitive if there's an insensitivity to a vulnerable part of you that will really hurt you well there's a couple things there one thing is that part of you is a part that you need to be able to honor and choose people who honor another is it could just very well be that you're the kind of person who feels it when people don't listen or hear other people you might have a tremendous sensitivity to people other people being honored that's a core gift place I'll give you another example. A client of mine came to work with me and she had been in a relationship for decades. And she said to me, Ken, you know, I'm, I'm a strong, accomplished woman and I'm in a relationship with a man who ignores me, neglects me and isn't there for me. And I can't leave. What is and, and that hurts me on a daily basis, this kind of not being seen. And we looked at, so she experienced that as a weakness and a vulnerability. But what we came to find was that there was a quality of loyalty so profound in her that it was incredibly hard to leave or give up on anyone she loved. It wasn't until she recognized the hurt and then said, all right, what's the gift in here that she was able to discover with me this quality of loyalty? And once she owned it, Everything changed because she realized she was fiercely loyal. And in all of her relationships, she began to realize she, um, she asked for a lot and she gave a lot. And if she loved you, she was going to be behind you until the end. Uh, once she realized that, she was able to leave this partner and find someone who really loved her for who she is. So these are just some examples, is that the places where you get hurt the most are the places where you're the most tender. And the places where you're the most tender are the places where you are the most beautiful. I'm I'm, I'm honestly just sort of struggling a little bit here because as we're talking, I'm feeling so moved and inspired that Uh (laughs) I'm feeling a little tongue tied. Oh, that's um, so nice. But um, I'm, I find myself curious for, since so many of us maybe found our way into relationship through some mix of inspiration and deprivation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what have you found working for people? So you just described this woman who ended up leaving her relationship. What do you find works for people who are in a relationship? Are there ways of amplifying the inspiration that actually can can lead to a course correction? You know, um, I'm so glad you asked that. And I know that that's so much at the heart of uh, what you and your partner do in your coaching work. Um, so, yes, I do have some thoughts on that. And uh, w- one of the thoughts is that... Um, this is something that, that a hero of both of ours, Harville Hendricks, uh, and his wife, Helen Kelly Hunt, Hunt, often talk about, is that uh, it, it reaches the point in your relationship, including in your good relationship, where the thing you most need from your partner is the thing that's hardest for him or her to give to you. 
And um, so, so you're raising such an important point here. An inspirational, uh, an attraction of inspiration will not remain completely inspiring. And you will hit points of deep deprivation in your relationship. And that's going to be the work. It's just, is it an essentially inspiring relationship? That's the big question. And then when it is, what do you do about these places of deprivation? And um, I just want to share something that I've been thinking about a lot the last few days uh, that I think simplifies that. I took a course once, and uh, there was a sentence that I learned in this course, and it was this. With the people you love, swing out more in terms of what you ask for and what you give. And I would say that uh, for most of us, you know, we get deeply hurt in our relationships, including our wonderful relationships, or wounded or not seen, because we're all separate beings and we're all so imperfect. But what I find again and again is that people are not, it's, it's very hard to feel um, self-loving and trusting enough to really, really, really ask for what you want. And uh, because you feel like you'll hurt the other person, or you feel like you're being too selfish. So we either don't ask and stay somewhat resentful, or we ask, but we ask in a way that isn't really coming from our place of need. It's coming from a place of like giving an order. But when we ask from a place of real authenticity, um, something very different happens. And I would say that, you know, in every relationship, there's a good struggle. And the good struggle is the place where your partner has a really hard time giving you what you need and where you have a really hard time giving your partner what you need. And that struggle place is a treasure. The question is not, do you not have it? The question is, do you both as a couple honor it? And if you do, that's just such an amazing thing. So I think this act of getting more and more vulnerable with your partner and really asking for what you need, swinging out in terms of what you ask for, but doing it from a place of want as a place, you know, as opposed to a place of obligation, uh, is is a very very powerful thing and having your partner do that with you is an amazing thing i love asking for the things that i felt i feel mortified to ask for <laughs> um, and then when i do it in a kind way it's usually nowhere near as mortifying as i imagined in fact it's liberating right and that that process of learning how to ask yeah is is a challenge often as well and and but it's such a worthwhile challenge because you get refined in in not um not coming from a place of being totally triggered and letting right. your, your triggeredness inform how you make your request versus again coming from that place where you're just being vulnerable and hopefully where you're you've established some safety with your partner so that you're honoring each other in those requests. Yeah, yeah. And it's such an act of intimacy because it's so scary. It's so scary. And this is a really interesting thing. There's a lot of research that shows when you get terrified, you're more likely to feel love. Like uh, th there was a really great study of uh, men walking across a really high suspension bridge, this like wobbly bridge, 250 feet over a raging river versus men walking on a little kind of like footpath over a tiny brook. And um, both men were uh, confronted by uh, researchers who were posing as interviewers who asked them a whole bunch of questions. And these were men, and these were heterosexual men, and these were attractive female interviewers. Anyway, the guys on the um, high bridge were more likely to be sexually attracted to the women, have sexual fantasies about them, and call them for dates afterwards than the guys on the low bridge. Because when we experience terror, when we experience height, when we experience edge, um, we're much more susceptible to deeper feelings of love and passion. So every time we like climb on that suspension bridge of sharing what's scary for us, there's a chance of really great passion on the other side. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. Yeah. And, and 
I'm trying to remember the, the there was something else I read in your book as well. I remember reading about the bridge and then there was another place where it was talking about how a partner might associate those feelings of like the rush or the thrill with 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 the other person versus just the circumstances that they're that they're in. Right. Yes. Yes. Misattribution that, yeah. <laughs> that, that you know, you, you mistake your terror for love and, <laughs> and sexual desire. So there are two directions that I want to go right now. Um, I'm going to choose uh-huh. one arbitrarily and then we'll circle back around to the other. Great. Um, the topic of honoring keeps coming up. Mm, yes. And yes, I'm yes. wondering if you can give us some insight into what that means. And, you know, I'm thinking about the aha process that you mentioned in your book. Um, but but in general, what is that quality of honoring and how is that different than just noticing or um, or allowing, let's say? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question because that's a really important one. And um, if you don't mind, I would love to read a little quote from the book. If, no, that's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the long run, it is the act of honoring ourselves and our partner that is the antidote to our bewilderment and the path to our unique genius. The act of self-treasuring may be challenging, but ultimately it's the most comforting path of all. Every other path hurts. Everything else is broken glass, sharp brambles at our, in our side. Honoring is the skill that enables us to live the beauty and mission of our core gifts in the world. Honoring requires giving up the whip we wield against ourselves. It requires a kindness, a listening to our gifts. So honoring is, I think it's it. Honoring is like the secret ingredient that, uh, that turns our bewilderments into, you know, potentially being transformational in a really positive way. And so what's honoring? Um, honoring is, you know, I just, I just have to share this story. Uh, there, was, there was a man, a pediatrician whose name was Le Boyer, and uh, he looked at at our um, our cultural way of of bringing a child into the into the world, which is you know you you the child is 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 birthed and then swatted in the butt, so it screams and that's its first breath of air, and everyone is in awe of the magic of that moment. <laughs> and he said, "Hey, that's violent. We don't need to do it that way." Uh, no one had thought of honoring, you know, in our culture, honoring the baby in a different way. So he placed the baby's body in warm water, just the same temperature of the womb. And there are videos of the child taking its first breath that could just, I, I can't even describe how beautiful that this kind of bud of a Buddha smile on the child's face and then the beginning of breathing. It's just completely, completely incredible. And um, there is a way that we are not taught to honor our deepest sensitivities. Like the world doesn't have time for them, or they're too sensitive, they're too vulnerable, they're too demanding, they're too needy, they're too original. But when we can take the time, like when you do that exercise of honoring the things that fill your heart and that hurt your heart, you will notice a deepening of self, which will make you feel like a much richer being. That's what happens when we honor ourselves. And in a conflict with someone we love, we usually don't honor ourselves, which pisses us off immensely. So then we don't honor our partner and we have to decide who more deserves to be honored. But if we can start out by honoring our sensitivity, there'll be room for our partner's sensitivity as well at the same time. So what I want to say to each one of you is if you practice honoring the fierceness of your passion, you will get wiser around how to express that passion in the world. And when you honor the tenderness of your sensitivity, you will become so much more beautiful at how you express it and share it and live it in the world. Yeah, that makes sense to me because I could see how this act of honoring allows you to be open to what's possible in expressing either your sensitivity or your passion and how 
conversely pushing your passion away because it's always come out like anger or rage or something or suppressing your vulnerability because that comes out as insecurity and weakness then you're you're actually probably um making it more likely that you'll experience the unhealthy like the shadow side of those um qualities Yes. And and shutting yourself off to the potential for learning the nuances of how to express those things. Oh, that was so beautifully said and so true, so true. You know, that, and I just want to kind of underline that first point you made that somehow when we honor those sensitivities, those passions, those places of core gift where maybe we felt like we need to suppress them, um, when we honor them, all of a sudden, a whole new set of possibilities just opens up, just blossoms for how we can express them. That's so true and, and just so, so important. So now I want to take, I want to go back to what I wanted to talk about before, and it's going to bring us into something that may feel a little bit like a detour, but I'm wondering, we've, we've actually talked a lot on this show about um, oxytocin versus dopamine and mm. and um, qualities of how to be sexual that mm. involve fostering oxytocin versus dopamine. We had Marnia Robinson of Cupid's Poison Arrow on the show. Mm. Um, we had Diana Richardson, Heart of Tantra and Slow Sex on the show. Um, and and it, it strikes me, you know, as I'm dwelling in my feel good state after just having read your book, mm-hmm. that um, that there's a lot of oxytocin going through my system right now. Mm-hmm. And it seems like these attractions of inspiration that it's actually probably in a lot of ways an oxytocin fostering uh, way of being out in the dating world and seeing who you're attracted to and and. So that all being said, because I I feel really good about that hypothesis I just made, um, I'm wondering about sex Mm. and passion. And I'm worried that people listening are going to be like, wait a minute, but I feel like, what about that charge? And I want that passion with a person. And I'm just going to be all like in my heart space and not feeling that like uh, kind of feeling. how so how does how do these relate how do how does the ability to be connecting in this way instead of the the deprived way cuz let's just assume that we don't want to go the deprived route the deprivation route right. just for the sake of good sex right. so how does this lead to good sex oh great question great question well you know the great news about all of this is that um I don't know. I guess it's that we're so various. Uh, a friend says, a friend of mine says that um, we are all God's multiple personalities. And uh, the same friend also says uh, that his definition of the word perverse means perverse, that you're expressing something through poetry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that. I really love that. And here's what I want to say about this is that... Uh, Okay, so for every one of you that thinks that I am saying just follow, just approach people who are good for you and not people that you're hot for or really attracted to, I'm not saying that at all. You deserve good sex. You deserve someone you're sexually attracted to. Um, That is not a bad thing. It's not a shallow thing. It's a good thing. Um, And I would also say, okay, so here's a question for everyone. Have you ever had an experience of sex where you have felt love, connection, and also like intense turn on, like um, some kind of combination of like like a real kind of like hot, hot sex, but also hard sex? Well, if you have experienced that place of both, That's the sweet spot. You know, I also say that we all have sexual core gifts. And that's the place where, like, turn on is really intense and love is really intense. And that is what we want. So here's the thing is, like, not only do we have – not only do we need to be cuddling and caressing and going slowly, but we need to, like, think what really – what really – gets me hard 
What really gets me wet? What really sexually excites me? What things, be they kinky or um, vanilla, are the kind of things that I would like masturbate thinking of, the things that are really juicy to me. And we need to be able to honor those and swing out in expressing and asking for those. And when you've got a lot of love going and then you're brave enough to share what ways of touching not only fill your heart but turn you on, what ways of moving, what ways of having sex, what kind of wild sex, what kind of tame sex, what kind of things really get you really speak your language of turn on and soul um and we need both we absolutely need both and when you have a partner with whom you not only feel love but you're like putting across an idea that's like wild and crazy and maybe a little embarrassing and mortifying and they get a kick out of it and they love it and you do it together the gift giving that goes on between the two of you in that crazy sex is like it's like nothing else and it's a wonderful thing it's like Christmas in bed. Yeah, I'm imagining that that it's actually like the perfect combination yep. of um because when when you're in that deprivation model, yeah, sure you might get really turned on, but everything else is like totally left up to chance. But what I hear you describing is this model of like where you're actually taking responsibility for your turn on. Yeah. And then you're fostering this fostering a partnership where there's space for you to share those core gifts around your sexuality. The things that that are are going to turn you on. And and uh, yeah. So it makes sense that now you're going to be amplifying those in your partnership. Exactly. It's the same kind of thing. Like you move closer to the fire of your truth and you express it to your loved one. Now, how would you know, though, like, let's say you were in a relationship or Mm -hmm. you met, you're dating and you meet someone and they seem amazing. They like honor your core gifts and they, um, you know, they're open to you. They're kind, they're generous, all of these things. But you're not totally feeling it like how would you know if that's like oh there's something wrong with me versus like i'm getting an intuition that even though this person is amazing they're not the amazing person for me right yeah 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 um that's a fabulous question and there's there's um i'm going to share some thoughts on that and i'll also say that you know there's a wealth of research of how to build turn on but there's got to be some turn on there so here's what happens is that Often, in an attraction of inspiration, part of the reason I was single for so long is that when I would meet someone who was decent and available, I would get bored instantly. I would be attracted to them, and then when I saw their kindness, their availability, their consistency, I would feel like, I can't breathe anymore. Bye! (laughs) And I would just, my, my attraction would just dissolve. It would plummet. That happens for a lot of us. And I, you know, um, I speak about that. I call it the wave in the book. And there are ways to get through that, that um, saved my life (laughs) as I learned how to do that. But um, so you meet someone and they seem like an attraction of inspiration. Let's assume there's some turn on. Because if there's no turn on, you're not obligated to be turned on to them. But let's assume that there's some spark. So what do you do with that? Um, the first thing you do is you don't force yourself to go further than you want to go. But the second thing you do is you think, where do I want to go? So maybe you're sitting with someone and you're on a first date and you think, I like her lips or I like his eyes and, um, would I want to sleep with him like right now? No. Would I want to maybe like, um, touch her leg? or rest my hand on his hand. Yeah, that I would like to do. So you honor that. You might not do it on the first date, but you kind of cultivate your desire. You let the sprouts of sexual romantic turn on gently begin to grow. You do not get drunk and have sex because then you won't want to be there the next day. (laughs) (laughs) And you don't even have sex before it's time. And you don't go on a two-day long date, no matter how crazy you are for that person, until you know them for a while. Because that kind of stuff is miracle grow for our fear of intimacy. We all 
call a fear of intimacy. So you basically nurture your turn-ons, you act on them in an appropriate way, and you don't guilt yourself or pressure yourself to doing any more than you want to do, and you enjoy them and you enjoy their company. And as my mentor said to me once when I was in a situation like that, he said, keep dating this guy. He said, if there was no spark, you wouldn't have to, but there is some spark. So keep dating him, and then in time, either he's going to become more beautiful to you, or he won't. And uh, that was great advice. Mm -hmm. So that's my advice on that front. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Ken, your your book, Deeper Dating, we've only scratched the surface. And uh, for for those of you who are single, I, I really recommend this book. It's such a fascinating read. It will warm your heart. It will inspire you. And it also reads like a how-to manual. So mm -hmm. if you're not feeling like you got every single bit of how-to from this conversation, don't despair. It is there in his book. And there's some really amazing practical advice that he gives, too, about how to approach dates where to where to find people to actually um, go out on dates with different little mini steps that that get you along the path and out of your comfort zone but not to not to the extent that you're gonna you know be too too uh, terrified to actually be in your core gifts as you're interacting with people but to actually give you an opportunity to to connect with people with whom you're more likely to have this kind of, of really inspired connection. So um, that being said, we're running out of time. I, w I did want to mention that Ken Page has generously offered a free copy of his book, Deeper Dating, to a lucky listener. If you are interested in winning that, you can qualify by downloading the show guide, which is available at neilsatin.com slash dating. D-A-T-I-N-G. Or you can always text the word PASSION to the number 33444 and follow the instructions for downloading the show guide and qualifying for the giveaway. So thank you so much for that, Ken. Sure, sure, sure. And if I get the person's name, I will uh, inscribe the book to them. Awesome. Yeah. And um, just in closing, I'm wondering if you can offer, um, if people want to find out more about you and your work, um, how do they do that? Thank you. Thank you. You know, there's always so many things going on. There are my Psychology Today posts. There are uh, free audio micro meditations. There are online courses that I do. And then there are other resources that I share um, and links to interviews like this interview, which was a, a very special and unique interview. So, Neil, thank you so much for my that. My pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you um, this is uh, this is obviously just this combination of of heart intellect, passion, and creativity, and um, just thank you for offering all of these interviews with so many people whose work I respect so deeply as, as a free gift to the world. Um, you're welcome, and I'm so pleased that you have come on to be a part of the part of the journey with me and with with everyone who's listening. So thank you. And so, so yeah, so people can just go to deeperdating.com. Excellent. And um, when you go there, you can actually sign up uh, for my mailing list and then receive uh, a free ebook, which is called The Four Insights That Lead You to Love. And uh, it's kind of, it's, it's a compilation of four pieces that I've written that have gone viral that kind of capture kind of, I think, the key four elements to this kind of deeper journey to love. Great. Well, I definitely encourage everyone to check out deeperdating.com and we'll have that link on the uh, on our website as well so you can f easily find your way to, to Ken's work. And um, Ken Page, thank you again so much for coming on the show today. It's been really a treasure to have you. Oh, thanks, Neil. This was just great. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. 
And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word passion, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.